If you don't know anything about cystic fibrosis, you can go to charitywrestling.com. We've got a bunch of links. You can look up what CF is, how it affects people, and how you can help. All right. Colin, I, I uh, appreciate the uh, <clears throat> all the information and the uh, and of course we appreciate you doing all this and all proceeds going to cystic fibrosis and uh, taking the time out of your life to uh, just put this all together a, a great event for a great cause uh, we're looking forward to it and I, I like to thank you for involving us and we'll continue our support throughout. And um, <clears throat> hopefully we'll we'll be talking to you again after that event for uh, maybe an, another CTW uh, charity charity event. That would be uh, fantastic. Like I said, please come to the show. You can get tickets at charitywrestling.com. If we sell the place out, if we do well, if we give a good uh, if we give a good check to charity, uh, we will be doing this again. If you want a if you want your charity to get involved in a future show, please let us know. Contact us. We're easy to find. And we'd love to talk. So, I mean, Kevin, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Nick. I really, I'm thrilled to be talking to you guys. And I will, uh, I'll see you at the show. I'm All proud right. to have you there. All right, Colin. Thank you, man. Take care. All right. You have a great day. Thank you. You too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Colin West. He is the head promoter of CTW Charity Wrestling. Check him out on Facebook. Um, Nick, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. It was good to hear him talk about that charity event. Uh, I, I, anything, anything for charity in my book is something great, especially when it comes from the wrestling business. Yep. So I mean, it's definitely good to hear him uh, talk him on the air and just talk about uh, what he's trying to do. Absolutely, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna we're gonna take uh, about a seven and a half minute break. It's not really a commercial break because we're gonna play the uh, the interview that we had with Lanny Poffo yesterday from the big event the brother of the late, great, and soon-to-be Hall of Famer, Macho Man, Randy Savage. So here you go. Tell me what you're saying. Okay. Uh, we're live at the big event, and I am here with uh, Leaping Lanny Poffo, also known as The Genius. Lanny, uh, welcome to the big event. The big event, yes. Uh, you can call me The Genius, full of glory and renown. Love it. I love it. A um, couple questions I want to ask you. One was, you know, I, I understand that uh, your dad, Angelo, was very heavily involved in the wrestling business. Uh, did you join, you know, in the business because of him, or was it more that something that you really wanted to do yourself? Well, I got into the business in 1973. My parents were very upset that I didn't want to go to college. I said, listen, I didn't even want to graduate high school, but I did it because of them. My dad said, well, you just don't look like a wrestler. You look like a teenage boy. And I said, well, I feel that I have what it takes. So um, next thing you know, I'm in the business. And that was 1973. And then in 1985, I make my debut 30 years ago in Madison Square Garden. You had the, uh, the, the gimmick of uh, writing some poems on uh, Frisbees. I remember those throwing them into the crowd. And that's all your material? Yes, but I stole the gimmick from a guy named Al Costello. Do you know him? I don't. He was in the fabulous Kangaroos. Roy Hefferman, Al Costello, and Wild Red Berry. He, he used to... Who is this? Anyway, he used to throw boomerangs into the crowd, cardboard boomerangs. So I said, what could I throw that would soar? And I said, Frisbees. And I put a poem on each one. And then finally they started marketing them. And they used to sell out every night because I used to go sign them. And because at the time the richest man in the world was Sam Walton, Walmart. Uh, and he said, what's the key to your success? From Bentonville, Arkansas, all the way to number one. He said, sell for less and be nice to people. So I, uh, and I was on TNT and I did a poem and Vince said, that's great. For now when you do a poem before every match. It, it worked. I mean, it was something that uh, it kind of stuck with you. People knew you for that, and then you kind of got into the uh, the gimmick of the of the genius coming down with your mortarboard and gown, and uh, you had the nice metal scrolls. And uh, but my one memory of you is you did the uh, the coronation for your brother when he became the king of WWE. And uh, I, I, I want to say thank you because I was like, that's a moment that'll last in my lifetime forever. Be t you know, the, the words that you said, the two using the ring together, uh, which leads me to my next question is, how come the two yous never were in the ring together? 
Well, I'll get back to that in a minute, but you got me all excited, and I want to go back in time, and I want to say, Please do. Behold, this humble entourage, their heads are bowed in reverence, at the very slightest whisper of one name, exalting in its pleasure, in, I'm sorry, I'm 60 years old now. <laughs> exalting in his splendor, which is altogether fitting, of the people and the lands from whence he came. False monarchies are commonplace as kingdoms rise and fall, but I, the genius full of glory and renown, say the macho man is everything that everybody everywhere would ever, ever want to wear a crown. I say this king deserves a queen beside him on the throne. Sherry is the fairest in the land. Nobody else is worthy of this monumental honor and the regal splendor of his royal hand. We witness the dethroning of one Jim the Hacksaw Duggan, whose crown and robe are in a state of rabbit. Ho! Oh, I now remove my mortarboard and place it near my heart, and thus proclaim you macho king, Randy Savage. Tape still bit gives me the chills. Yeah, it's my favorite poem of all time. Uh, I'm now, did you ever think of maybe marketing that, putting it on uh, a prince, with you and your brother, or maybe the scene from the ring, and uh, marketing that? Uh, I've got two books out, and uh, that poem is in the, one of the books. Okay. So, how come you and Randy never squared off in the ring, tagged up, nothing? Well, these decisions are not made by <laughs> myself or my brother, but we all had a... a we all had a niche to fill, and I did my best with what I had. No, oh, you did. You you played, um, as I like to call it, the the ultimate heel. Uh, you didn't need a belt. You you just you did your job. People hated you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of feel like they took the uh, the Damien Sandow character when he first came in with the robe and everything. I feel that they kind of got that character from your genius character. Well, I thought it was a fantastic form of flattery. <laughs> you know, and uh, Randy wasn't upset either about um, uh, black machismo. Yes. So, you know, it's a form of flattery. In fact, he gave him his blessings. Um, two more questions. Uh, one I'd like to ask you is, do you feel that a tremendous amount of pressure may be lifted off your shoulders now that you gave the okay for Randy to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? You have no idea how relieved I am, but the hardest part is convincing my mother. You know, she's 88 years old, she's Jewish, very, very stubborn, her feelings were hurt, no condolences, and, um, you know, Randy, she knew that, just like I did, that Randy's wishes were the Poffo family or nothing. But, when I, you know, I just turned 60 years of age, but that's supposed to be a big deal. But that wasn't for me. 59 was the biggest deal for me because that was the day I became the older brother. And I thought about all the times I didn't get my way. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. So I said, well, I can get my way now. And uh, the, the fans had suffered long enough. And in the words of the late Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Live long and prosper. Absolutely. And um, why, why Hogan? You know what? Just like Rodney King, can't we all get along? <laughs> I'm only going to live, let's say I live to be 100. That's only 40 more years. I'm not going to spend one day of it pissed off over nothing. Understand? Um, social media, how can fans reach out to uh, Lonnie Poffo? Well, you can like me on Facebook, and that's Lanny the Genius Poffo. And uh, my website is geniuslannypoffo.com. And um, check it out. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Is this a big pod podcast or a small one? Um, well, I can't say small because then I, you know, make... How big is it? Uh, we, we reach out to a little over about 1,500 fans a week. Wow. I'll tell you what, if the Macho Man were here, he'd say there are, there are no small podcasts, just small wrestlers. <laughs> Lanny, thank you very much. All right, God bless, buddy. Bye-bye. And ladies and gentlemen, that was former WWE superstar, uh, went by the name of uh, Leaping Lanny Poffo early in his career, and then late in his career, he was the genius Lanny Poffo. Um, 
you know, my memory, as I stated, of him standing in the ring wearing his mortarboarding gown with his metal scroll, reading off that coronation poem uh, for his brother who just became the macho king of Randy Savage and Queen Sherry. And uh, it was just, you know, you want to talk about a ring full of heels when uh, that all went on. And it was... Uh, it was a great moment. I think it was a great moment in in his career. I think it was a great moment, in probably, uh, in his personal life to to be involved in something with Randy in the WWE because neither one of them uh, faced each other. Neither one of them tagged up against each other. It was literally the only time they were in the ring together in their WWE careers, which I find really, really weird. Really weird, but. <laughs> So, did you did you know that, Nick? No, I, I think we talked about that, about that being the single time that they were in the, in the ring together in the WWE. I mean, like we've also talked before, uh, Lanny really was a big. He never got that big push in the WWE when he was uh, with with the company. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that. But I kind of felt like his character almost didn't need. Um, a push that he was kind of like that ultimate heel, um, like what kind of Ted DiBiase wound up being. Like he didn't really need yeah. a title. That you know he was that ultimate heel. Everybody hated him when he showed up. People would just go out of their out of their ways to boo him. And you know sometimes that's a reward in itself. That you, you don't always need that belt. And, and you could say that for a guy like Roddy Piper too, a guy that never really got that belt, yeah. but. He was, sometimes he was in a main event picture, but at the same time, he, he was always that he was he was always entertaining, and he never really needed that huge push or that big title. Yep, you say the same thing with a guy like Jake the Snake Roberts, uh, exactly. Rick Rude. I mean, you know, though some of them had had the Intercontinental Championship, which meant something back then. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, well, I know you and I can go on days and days with that one. So ah, uh, yeah, it's just it's just. Ugh. And I don't know. I don't know what I don't know where it all went wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's been it's been it's been probably like a good two decades. I think it was the whole start of you know Chris Jericho they, when they changed the belt design. Yeah, you know, and it, you know Jericho. Oh, I'm a seven time intercom. Really, you know, it was prestigious when you were a one or two time champion. Now and, you're and, seven and time also champion. Those long, those long reigns are what really meant something. Yeah, like, you know, uh, what's his face? Um, Honky Tonk Man. Yeah. I mean, you know, the guy still calls himself the greatest intercontinental champion of all time, and you know what? There's very little argument against the fact. Well, I mean, he held the, di- he held the belt for, what, 300-something days, was it? I can't even remember the, n- the yeah. number. You know, look at what CM Punk had the world title for that long and how much went into that and the, the, how much that number meant something. Exactly. Now it's I, like, feel long, I feel like long title reigns are what really make the belt and what really make the wrestler. Exactly, and that's why I hope they patch up all this nonsense that's going on with Brock Lesnar because yep. I want Lesnar still to be the champion at WrestleMania because he's actually brought credibility and meaning to the world title. And you know what? And, and yes, a lot of people are going to harp on him because, because he's not around, but you know what? Is that helps his heel persona. It does it and he don't need to be around because he just he just the aura of his name, the aura of him being a beast, the aura of not knowing if he's gonna pop out of the back or he is, it just improves the storyline of whatever he's involved in. Yep, and and uh, and honestly as much as I think he should be the champ after WrestleMania, I don't think it will happen. Um probably I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, there was so many conflicting stories going out there. That he said no to MMA because of the concussion issues. That he wanted he wanted to stay with WWE. He wanted to get that contract done before WrestleMania. Uh, there's scenarios out there whether um, if he has an L, a rib injury, like in, a, in a, his match coming up, a, a match with uh, Roman Roman Reigns or. Uh, a storyline with Roman Reigns, like he comes out before WrestleMania and gets a spear, yep. and then now he's got a rib injury going into WrestleMania. That means he's going to drop the title, and he's going to use that as, as an excuse. Um, 
if they don't go that way, he's going to hold on to the title because uh, they, they got things done. You know, the whole backstage... Uh,